To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. Hello dear students, today in this lecture we are going to be revising the chapter interpretation of statutes which is the last chapter of your other laws portion. Right Now this chapter generally comes for a good 3 to 4 marks every single time in the examination. Most of the questions they are also from the study material so make sure that in the study material you definitely do all the questions that are existing. Now let's quickly revise this entire chapter. Now in this chapter, first of all, we are going to understand what exactly is interpretation of statute. Then after that, we are going to be discussing rules of interpretation. So there are some primary rules of interpretation and then there are some secondary rules of interpretation. Then we'll discuss some internal aids to interpretation and external aids to interpretation. After that, we are going to understand how the deeds and documents are to be interpreted. So that is all we are going to be discussing today. Let's start off with the introduction. So first of all, what is a statute? When we say statute, it basically means law, written law. So written law means the parliament creates different types of laws. For example, let's just talk about the Companies Act. Okay, we have studied the Companies Act of 2013. So that act contains a lot of provisions. Along with that act, we also have to read the parallel rules. So even rules are a part of the statute. Rules basically contain the procedures to follow whatever laws are stated in the act. Along with that, we also have some schedules. So in the Companies Act also, we have schedule 1 to schedule number 7. Now, a lot of the provisions are stated in the schedules also. Along with that, every single year, uh, at different times throughout the year, the Companies Act is also changed. changed. In certain sections, there are certain changes that are brought by the parliament. They are brought by certain notifications. Okay, these amendment notifications are also applicable for us. So whenever we are studying any act, rules or schedules, we also have to check whether there are any applicable uh, notifications regarding amendments. So that is also part of statute. Along with that, government also issues certain orders, circulars, regulations that help us in interpretation of the act, rules, schedules and notifications. Right. So all of this together is called statute. Next, we are understanding what is a document. So the word document has been defined in your Indian Evidence Act in section number three. Along with that, it has also been explained in the General Clause Act. Now, what is a document? Okay, document means a matter expressed or described upon a substance by means of letters, figures, marks intended to record some matter. Okay, now we understand document very simply. It means that something is written, something is recorded, some facts are recorded on, or some details are recorded on a substance. This substance could be a piece of paper, it could be an online document, it could be a stone, it could be a painting, it could be anything. Okay, through some means. Now these means could be letters, figures, marks. All right. So writing alphabets A, B, C, D or 1, 2, 3, 4 numbers or some other symbols. All those things can be used to record some facts, some matter on a substance. Right. That is what a document is. Right. So it is not just limited to a piece of paper. It can be electronic. It can be uh, something written on a painting or a stone. Next up, instrument. Now see. A document can be of many different types. One of the type of document is instrument. Now the word instrument, have we discussed it somewhere? See, we have discussed the Negotiable Instrument Act. So in that we had the bills of exchange, we had the promissory notes, right? We had the checks. We call them instruments, right? So these instruments are basically documents, first of all. So all the properties of the document are there in the instrument. Along with that, some facts are recorded on such instrument wherein somebody's right is created, somebody's liability is created. So just like how in a bill of exchange, one party is supposed to make some payment to the other party, right? So this is a fact which is stated, the time period within which the payment is to be made, that is stated, the party's name is stated, right? That is an instrument wherein uh, one party is right and other party's liability is created, right? Next on, what is a deed? Okay, so deed and instrument are very much similar to each other. When we say deed, it is again another document. Okay, something is written down on a substance. For example, it could be a transfer deed. So A is transferring shares to B or a property to B. They both are going to execute a document, right? It is going to be considered as a transfer deed, right? This is generally going to be legally binding both the parties. Next up, what is interpretation? The whole chapter revolves around interpretation of statutes. We have understood what is statutes. Statute means the acts, rules, the bylaws relating to it, the schedules relating to it, notifications. Now, when we say interpretation, what does it mean? It means to interpret, to find out the meaning 
of whatever is stated in the act rules bylaws etc right so interpretation basically means just read the plain statute and derive the meaning of it what exactly the law makers wanted the law to be what is the intention behind the law behind the legislation accordingly we will have to apply okay so sometimes uh, you know it is difficult to understand somebody's language when i'm talking to you i'm talking in plain language you might be talking to me in plain language but sometimes it becomes a little difficult to understand what the other person is trying to say okay that happens in communication same way when lawmakers are creating the law also they use plain english language but then still sometimes it is difficult to understand what exactly did they mean when they were writing this law what did they exactly want the law to be sometimes see the language is not as accurate as maths so it is difficult to understand the intention behind the language so then we use certain rules that we are going to be discussing for the purpose of interpretation right now what is the importance of interpretation why do we have to interpret the statute let's discuss that see two different set of people create legislations and use interpretation so there is a bridge of understanding see it is the parliament that creates the law versus it is the layman people who are using these laws they are interpreting these laws they are applying these laws moreover sometimes if there is a dispute between two parties then this matter goes to the courts then it is the judges the lawyers who try to interpret who try to understand these legislations so the people who create the law versus the people who use the law they are two different people and when there are two different people or two or more different people they are trying to understand the same language they all have different purposes so accordingly they are going to have different interpretations right it is simple language so in order to bridge that understanding in order to properly understand what a uh, law is written for we need interpretation right next is the time in which the legislation is created versus interpreted that is different so it may be possible see for example the companies act okay it is created in 2013 right now it is 2022 that is going on so there is already a gap of 9 years here right so if we take any other statute also it is created 50 years ago or 100 years ago and we are trying to understand its meaning now so times keep on changing civilization keeps on growing so trying to interpret what was the intention of the law makers back then and then using that intention to solve our problems right now it is important so the times of writing is also different therefore we need to interpret uh, the intention interpret the law so that is another need of interpretation next the process of interpretation makes use of technical legal jargon in different laws there are different terms which are used there is different technical language which is used which may not be equally understandable to different people right so in that case we kind of need to interpret the statute okay for example in the companies act we have so many different words companies there uh, securities is there then we use meetings general meetings is there etc so many different new words are there which normal people do not understand so for that also we kind of need to interpret for some of these words definitions have been provided in the act for some of these words definitions are not provided so how do we understand the meaning should we take the definition from the dictionary or should we take the definition from any other law etc so we have to see what is the intention of the law maker accordingly we will have to do, do the interpretation of such uh, complicated words then no language is perfect we understand that okay so even though in english in the best possible english uh, the law makers write down the law still it is just english right so it can be different it can be difficult to understand therefore we need interpretation right it is important to understand the intention of the law makers okay that is also another important point social conditions keep on changing and so different times might have different intentions for example 50 years ago 20 years ago there was not enough technology okay there was not enough communication based on technology like we have right now right now we have so many different social media platforms to communicate we are just a call away just a text away that was not the case 50 years ago 20 years ago 30 years ago right so law created 20 years 30 years 40 years ago did not take this into anticipation now when we are going to be interpreting the law we will have to consider the social circumstances and the conditions prevalent now okay so see the social conditions keep on changing so accordingly also we will have to do such interpretation which suits the times okay for example in any law created 20 years 30 years 40 years before now might just say that the way of communication is simply post registered post okay however now we have emails also so if we try to interpret that law in today's time we will also include elements like emails or other social media ways of communication also okay those kind of 
communication things were not available back in those days so they did not include it in that law however now when we try to interpret institute we will have to include these things also right next let's talk about the classification of interpretation as per zoluvics okay he classifies interpretation in two parts legal classification or doctrinal classification when we say legal classification it means that the interpretation of the statute is already established there is an actual rule that governs the law what does that mean it means that there is a law there is a statute there is a provision okay and that meaning of that provision is already derived it is already established that is called legal classification of interpretation in that case there are two possible parts to it there are two sub classifications authentic legal classification or usual legal classification when we say authentic it means directly by reading the statute we are able to derive its meaning versus when we say usual uh usual classification in that case the meaning is derived from other sources it could be from the uh, customs of trade or it could be from case laws what does that mean it means that simply when we understand the statute we are able to derive a meaning there is a certain way it has it is being practiced it is authentic classification versus when directly from the understanding of the statute we do not know its meaning however there is a case study which has explained the meaning of this provision then we use that case study or we generally see in practice how that law is interpreted what is the custom of trade according to that law that is called usual interpretation all right next up is doctrinal what is doctrinal interpretation of the statute it means that when there is no law to interpret in that case we have to go beyond what is stated in the statute and we have to derive the meaning of that statute it means here there is no case study here there is no specific way in which that statute is interpreted in the normal customs of trade and from the language also we are not able to understand exactly what is the meaning of that statute in that case this is called doctrinal interpretation in case of doctrinal interpretation there are two sub classification grammatical and logical grammatical means we simply try to understand and interpret the language we understand the grammar which is used in the language and we try to interpret it and based on that we try to understand what is the meaning of the statute versus logical logical means we go beyond the words to try to discover the intention of the statute okay whatever is written down in the law we go beyond it we try to understand why that statute was made why that provision was made what kind of problem it wants to solve what is the current circumstance what is the current social situation based on that what should be the interpretation we go beyond the words that is called logical interpretation next let's move on to the classification of interpretation which is given by fitzgerald okay he says that interpretation can be divided into literal or grammatical or functional classification when we say literal interpretation it simply means use the language okay it gives conclusively the importance to the language which has been used if it is english we have to understand the grammar we have to read the language plain simple language has to be used to understand it we do not have to go beyond it when we say functional classification it means you have to go logical this is similar to the logical interpretation that we just discussed we don't simply have to look at the words we have to go beyond we have to try to understand the intention of the law makers and try to interpret law accordingly now whenever we use the word interpretation there is also another word construction which is used there is a difference between interpretation and construction what is the difference do you know when we say interpretation it means that the language is simple and ambiguous there is a clear intention of the legislation that we can understand from the language accordingly using the grammatical meaning we have to understand what is the meaning of the statute that is called interpretation okay that means you simply read the language uh, whenever the statute is written from the reading of the language you are able to understand what exactly is the intention of the law maker what is that provision basically simply by plain reading it is sufficient to derive the meaning of what needs to be done that is called interpretation not much effort required here versus sometimes it may be possible that the language is not that clear there is an ambiguity there are two or three possible meanings that uh, can exist the circumstances are such that we do not know exactly what the statute wants us to do in that case we have to use construction construction means you go beyond what is just stated you try to understand the intention of the law makers because because it is not clear okay try to create a whole meaning according to the circumstance that is prevalent that is called construction go beyond the words so there is a slight difference between these two basically construction is going one step ahead of interpretation when interpretation doesn't work we try to construct a meaning okay interpretation 
when there is simple simple meaning available when there is just one possible uh, meaning available from the reading of the statute then we simply do interpretation we don't have to construct a whole different story a whole different meaning versus when this doesn't work we have to go to construction now let's try to understand the process of interpretation throughout this chapter we are basically going to try to understand how to interpret laws there are so many different statutes in our country when you will sit down with an act how will you actually interpret it okay so first of all in the statute itself there is going to be a definition section it could be section 2 it could be section 3 you use those definitions to understand the meaning of certain words in that statute those definitions have to be used in that statute only that is one way of interpreting the statute another way is let's say Uh, we are not able to find a definition in the statute itself for example a word is not defined in the companies act then how do you understand the meaning of that word you go to the general clause act we have discussed the general clause act in the general clause act there are general definitions which are given there are general provisions which are given if something is not very clearly specified in any given statute then we come to the general clause act from the general clause act we use the general provisions to interpret those statutes if specific provisions are not available in those acts right apart from that let's say there is no such backing there is no definition also there is no definition or rule in the general clause act also then what do you do about it okay in that case what are we going to be using we are going to use some rules of interpretation right now we will be discussing certain primary rules and secondary rules of interpretation use those rules and try to understand what the law makers really want as to follow okay other than that we can also use certain case studies for example on certain provisions it may be possible that in the past also some people had disputes so they filed a case in the court in the court there were hearings and hearings the court finally decided that this should be interpreted this is how you have to follow the statute okay so if suppose in the case studies also a statute has been given meaning it its interpretation is already done in the past we can use those case studies also in the current circumstance to try to interpret that statute right apart from that we are also going to be uh, doing the aids of interpretation internal and external aids of interpretation okay basically when we study the rules how do we actually apply those rules these aids are basically tools to apply the rules of interpretation okay we will understand this further let's try to understand these different rules of interpretation now next let's move on to the rules of interpretation so these are primary rules and secondary rules in primary rules we are going to be discussing the rule of literal construction reasonable construction harmonious construction the mischief rule or the havens rule the rule of beneficial construction exceptional construction and adjustum generis in secondary rule also we are going to be studying these two rules that is nociter a socis and contemporanea expositio let's start off first of all let's talk about the rule of literal construction so here the word literal construction is used literal construction basically means just literally read the statute and then interpret it so you simply have to focus on the ordinary natural and grammatical meaning of the language which is used in the statute based on the natural language of the statute you have to interpret it so you do not have to go beyond those words that is what this rule simply says this is the first rule we always have to try to apply on a statute okay so you will not jump to reasonable construction or the mischief rule before attempting this literal construction rule if from a plain reading of the statute you are able to understand what is the meaning what is written what is the provision great you don't have to go beyond that however if suppose which is simply by reading the statute you're not able to understand uh, there are two possible meanings coming out of it or there is ambiguity or it doesn't suit the circumstances in which that law has to be applied in that case we go beyond we uh, use the rule of reasonable construction or the mischief rule or all the other rules right the word which has definite and clear meaning should be interpreted with that meaning only nothing has to be added to the statute and nothing has to be removed from the statute so when we read the statute uh we cannot add anything extra to it we should not even remove anything from it okay so whatever has been stated we have to accurately read that and interpret that only this is what this rule of literal construction says if any technical words are there then they have to be understood in technical sense only so if suppose there is any word which is specifically used in botany or in a geography then those technical words have to be interpreted according to their technical meaning only if suppose there is no specific meanings mentioned next rule is rule of reasonable construction reasonable reasonable means that you don't don't just have to read the language if suppose the plain reading of the statute does not give an accurate result 
it gives an ambiguous result if there are more than two interpretations possible if it does not suit the current circumstance in that case we have to be a little reasonable we have to be a little flexible we have to go beyond what is stated in the words okay and we have to try to understand that what is the intention of the lawmakers why was that particular statute created so what is the intention and based on that intention of the legislation we have to try to construct the meaning we have to try to interpret in those terms beyond what is just stated so that is called the rule of reasonable construction while interpreting a law two meanings may be possible one making the statute absolutely vague and meaningless and the other leading to certainty and a meaningful interpretation in that case the second option should be chosen the next rule we are discussing is the rule of harmonious construction now this rule says that when we have to interpret two or more statutes together two or more provisions are there and they are applicable together on an object or a person or a circumstance then we have to interpret both of them in harmony we cannot ignore one for the other we have to interpret in such a way that both are given effect okay for example we have a company let's say that in the article of association of company the quorum of the company's general meeting is 50 and let's say as for the company's act if we calculate the quorum of the company it comes to 20 so this is the minimum number of members that should be present in the company's general meeting for the meeting to be valid now in this case see both of these provisions are applicable on the company right and both of these provisions are talking about the same thing they are talking about the quorum of the company's general meeting so which provision will apply whether the company's quorum is going to be 15 or 20 so in this case we have to interpret in such a way that both these provisions are satisfied so in that case let's say we keep the quorum of the company as 20 in that case both of these provisions are going to be satisfied see the article say that minimum quorum has to be 15 so if the quorum is 20 of course the minimum criteria is satisfied same way the second part will also be satisfied companies act is any which way is saying that the quorum should be 20 okay so we have to interpret both the provisions so that both the provisions are given effect we have to try to interpret in that way now let's try to understand the meaning of some words that are used in the statute for example subject to or notwithstanding or without prejudice many times when we are reading the provision it may be stated that provision a is going to be applicable subject to provision b in that case what is the meaning of the word subject to okay so let's say you want to play okay and i tell you that you can play subject to studying for two hours in that case it basically means that you can follow the first part of this line but only and only if the second part of the line that means whatever is stated after subject to that is followed okay so that is how we have to understand subject to this basically means that whatever provision is stated after subject to that will be superior that has to be followed first and after that if it is satisfied then the provision which is stated before subject to that is going to apply okay now that is the meaning of subject to now let's talk about notwithstanding notwithstanding means that whatever provision is stated after notwithstanding we have to ignore that provision okay so provision a is going to apply notwithstanding provision b so that means provision a is going to apply irrespective of whatever is stated in provision b so that is what is the meaning of notwithstanding now sometimes in an act it may be stated that Provision A is going to be applicable notwithstanding anything contained in another section. It means that other section has to be ignored. First, we have to follow this provision. It may be stated sometimes that provision A is going to be applicable notwithstanding anything contained in the statute. It means we have to ignore every other provision in that act, in that statute with respect to this provision. Okay, so provision A is applicable notwithstanding the entire statute. That means nothing else in the act is going to apply only provision a is going to apply in this circumstance wherever provision a is applied the other provisions of the act will not be applicable okay notwithstanding anything contained in any specific section or specific provision or specific rules again this means that we have to ignore that specific section specific provision or specific rule which is stated after notwithstanding okay notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force it means that in india whatever laws are applicable whatever different acts are prevalent whatever different rules are prevalent we have to ignore all of that okay provision a will apply notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the timing in force it means all the other act statutes will have to be ignored when this provision applies so that is the meaning of notwithstanding next without prejudice what is the meaning of without prejudice 
it basically means provision a is going to be applicable without prejudice to provision b it basically means that provision a and provision b they will be simultaneously applicable okay we cannot ignore provision b when provision a is being applied so without prejudice means whatever provision is stated after without prejudice that provision will also be applicable we are not going to ignore whatever is stated in that provision that is what without prejudice means the particular provision shall operate in addition to and not in derogation with the general provision right so that is what these three terms mean next we are seeing the hayden's rule or the mischief rule what is the hayden's rule or the mischief rule now this rule of construction basically says that when you are trying to interpret a provision you are trying to interpret a statute you have to ask four questions the first question is what was the law before making an act so when we are trying to interpret the let's say the gst laws then we have to ask the question what was the law before that so before that we know vat was prevalent okay next question is what was the defect or mischief or the hardship which was caused by the earlier law this is the second question you have to ask so in case of gst before that we had the vat now what was the problem with vat there was double taxation in vat and it was different for different states okay so that was the problem that problem had to be removed okay next the third question you have to ask is how does the act of the parliament seek to resolve or cure the mischief so that means this new act which has been brought which we are trying to interpret how is this particular act solving that previous problem we have to ask that so in gst law what exactly is it so we have a single tax that is going to be applicable throughout different states right so that is how we are trying to avoid the double taxation okay so you have to see how is the cure available in the new statute compared to the old statute and the third and the last question that you have to check is what are the two reasons for the remedy why was this particular provision brought into picture okay so that is the last question you have to ask so this mischief rule says that whenever you are trying to interpret a law please ask all of these four questions now when you are going to answer all of these four questions you will understand what is the intention behind that legislation based on that intention we can try to interpret the different sections in that act now how are you going to find out all of these things see with respect to that we are going to be using certain external tools of interpretation we will see the parliamentary history we are going to see the different discussion papers we will see the draft bill that was passed the different objections that were raised when that particular act was coming into uh, the picture right all of those things will have to be properly read evaluated and accordingly we are going to find out all of these answers based on which we are going to do the interpretation so that is your mischief rule please note this mischief rule is very very important with respect to your examination it is often asked in the examination so make sure you definitely do this next is the rule of exceptional construction exceptional construction exceptional means something out of the way so sometimes what happens is that in the statute uh, there are certain words which are useless they're not solving the purpose they might confuse the statute okay so we have to remove those words or we have to interpret them in a different way to properly understand what the statute says that is what this particular rule says now these words can be and or may shall must right so see when we say and it means let's say i'm saying that provision a and provision b should apply it means both provision a and provision b both are going to apply in a certain circumstance so this and means both the things which are written before and after and they are applicable versus when we say or then it basically means it's an option okay whether a or b is going to be applicable so either a or b is going to be applicable right now sometimes what happens is that in the law sometimes or is written in place of and and sometimes and is written in place of or generally this doesn't happen and generally we have to understand these words just like how we have discussed its actual meaning and means that both the items that are stated before and after and they are to be considered or means it's an option generally we have to consider it like that only but sometimes it may be possible that these words are written in a wrongful manner in that case we have to totally understand what that statute is saying and accordingly we have to interpret and as or 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 we have to interpret or as and all right similarly let's talk about the word may and shall or must okay when we say may it means there is an option okay it is not a mandatory provision 
So if I say the company may file a return, it basically means that it is up to the company. If the company wants to file the return, the company can file the return. If the company does not want to file the return, it may not file the return. Okay, if I say that company may file the return, right? So I hope you have understood this is an optional provision. And when we say shall or must, it means it's a mandatory provision. So if I say that the company shall file a return or must file a return, then it means that the company does not have an option. The company will have to file the return. If the company does not file the return, then the company is going to be penalized or the officers are going to be penalized. It is going to be against the law, right? So that is the general meaning. But sometimes it may be possible that may is used in place of shall and sometimes shall is used in place of may. Generally doesn't happen, but if suppose it happens and we read the statute and it gets a little confusing, then accordingly we have to do the interpretation. We have to understand may also as shall and shall as may. Okay, so it depends from case to case. For example, let's say in the act it is stated that the company may file a return. However, if the company fails to do so, then the company shall be liable to a penalty of so and so. Okay, so here there are two things used. First of all, we are saying that the company may file a return. However, in the second part of the section, it is stated that if the company does not file the return, then there is going to be a penalty. Okay, so from the reading of the provision, is it compulsory for the company to file the return? Well, see, even though the word may has been used, the company may file a return. Still, because there is a penalty if the company does not file the return, we can kind of understand that it is compulsory for the company to file the return, right? So, in that case, the may is going to be interpreted as shall, right? So, we have to see how these words are used and accordingly, if there is confusion, then we have to accordingly uh, use a different interpretation. So, that is your rule. Of the next rule is the rule of adjusting generis. Now, what is this rule? It rule says that if suppose in a section certain words are used, they are specific words and after those specific words, there are some general words that are following. Then the meaning of that general word shall be construed according to the meaning of those specific words. This is what this rule says. Now, what does this exactly mean? See, let's say I'm saying that a specific provision, let's say provision A is applicable on cats, dogs, and other such animals okay now in this case see there are specific words this cat is a specific word cat does not mean anything else it just means a cat we have all seen a cat same way dog is also a specific noun okay uh, dog we know what is a dog right however when we say other such animals now this is a general word this is specifically a few general words they can have any meaning so when we say other such animals what does it exactly include See, provision A is applicable on cats, dogs and other such animals. So, what does other such animals include? With respect to other such animals, we have this particular rule which says that when general words are following certain specific words, then general words will derive its meaning from the specific words. They will have the properties of those specific words. So, other such animals should be similar animals like cats and dogs. So, if I say whether tiger is going to be included in other such animals, the answer is going to be no. Whether snake is included, the answer is going to be no. Why? Because these animals are not like cats and dogs. They are not tameable. Let's assume that cats and dogs have the common property of them being tameable. That means we can keep them in their houses. They, we can play with them, right? Whereas we cannot play with tiger or snake, okay? So this other such animal can include a cow. Cow is a tameable animal. A horse can also be included. Okay, so all those animals which can be pets, they can be included here. So whenever general words are following specific words, they derive its meaning from the specific words. This is what this particular rule says. This rule has to be used in certain circumstances. So these were all your primary rules. Now let's talk about certain secondary rules of interpretation. First one is nociter a socis. What does this mean? It means that let's say there are two or more words that are placed together. In that case, we have to derive their meaning according to each other. For example, let's say in a statute, it is stated plant and machinery. All right. Now, machinery is something we understand. Machinery basically means it is, it is an equipment. Versus when we say plant, plant can have certain meanings. Plant can also mean a plant which is growing in the garden. Okay. Whereas plant can also mean a plant which is like a factory. Okay. So in that case here, when we say plant and machinery, what is the meaning of plant here? So here, see, there are two specific words which are used. 
whenever two specific words are used with each other then we have to relate them together their meaning is going to be derived from each other this is what this nociter a socus says so accordingly the meaning of plant is not going to be the plant which grows in our garden but it is going to be the factory okay a huge plant in which some manufacturing is happening so that is the meaning of plant same way let's take one more example so let's say uh, earlier there was this purchase tax act now in the purchase tax act there was an entry which was manufactured beverages including fruit juices and bottled water and syrups okay this was an entry on which tax was levied now in this the word fruit juices was something which was confusing now does fruit juices include the fruit juices that are selling out of fresh fruits which we can find on vendors on the street does it include that or does it just mean the manufactured fruit juice okay like real fruit juice okay so what does it actually include so we have to read this term according to the words that it has been used with so here we see that manufactured beverages is written including that means it's an inclusive term it includes fruit juices bottled water and syrups so that means here the fruit juices bottled water and syrups these are all supposed to be manufactured beverages so they cannot be fresh fruit juices okay so that was what was decided in this particular case description in this particular case law also right so accordingly in this particular item we are going to be using the nociter a socus rule and we will understand that fruit juices here does not mean fresh fruit juices it means manufactured fruit juices next rule is the doctrine of contemporanea exposito okay now what does that mean this basically means that the meaning of the words in a document or a statute have to be understood in the sense that they bore at the time of the document's creation or the statute's creation so whenever we are trying to interpret a statute or a document we have to see that in what circumstances that document was created in what circumstances that statute was created based on the circumstance in which these documents were created we have to try to interpret those statutes or the words in the document right so we basically have to uh, give more importance to the situations in which these were created because these situations might change up if they change up then what was the original intention of these words or the statute we have to see that okay for that we have to see in which situation these laws were created right based on that once we figure out what is the intention of that law we can apply that same intention in the current circumstance also and accordingly we can do the interpretation right another doctrine here which is used is optima legum interpres est construe it means that the custom is the best interpreter of law it basically means that if suppose we are not able to understand a statute or a law then let's just see how it is being practiced in real life okay so we are going to be basically noticing as the app as to the applicability of those laws in actual customs and customs of trade accordingly we will be able to understand what is the actual intention how that law has to be interpreted okay generally speaking even sometimes when there is a nuance in the law if there is a loophole in the law then usually people adapt to that loophole people adapt to that nuance people start practicing something which is very common in the entire trade okay so we have to see what is that common trade practice which is being used for example uh, in the negotiable instrument act there are certain points which are not very clear okay so in that case we see the actual practice in real life how these instruments are created and traded accordingly we try to interpret this act okay so if suppose we are not able to understand a law we can check the general trade practices and accordingly we can do the interpretation so those were all your rules of interpretation the primary rules and the secondary rules now let's quickly discuss the internal aids of interpretation okay now see we have so far discussed the different rules that you have to apply to interpret the statute now these are just rules these are plain simple principles that you have to apply when you are trying to interpret okay but in order to properly use these rules you actually need some more tools you need some aids you need some help you need some information now what is this information where is it, is it going to come from so for that we have the internal aids to interpretation and the external aids to interpretation when we say internal aids that means internal to what these are internal to the statute so in the statute itself we have certain things certain additional information which is provided by the lawmakers we can use these additional information to try to understand what exactly is the statute what is the law exactly trying to say okay so first let's talk about these internal aids after that we are going to discuss the external aids when we say external aids to interpretation again these are tools these are information which is provided outside the statute this information can be used again to try to construct and interpret the statute okay now let's quickly revise these internal aids first 
first of all it is a long title the long title or the short title now for any act there is a short title the short title is used for reference purpose for example with respect to the companies act we know the short title is the companies act 2013 this is not the long title okay versus its long title is also there the long title of the companies act is the company it is the act to consolidate and amend the laws relating to the company so that is the long title of the company's act okay now when we say short title it is more like a nickname okay so you also have a main name which is your name and your middle name and your surname versus there is also a nickname that you might be having okay so when we say short title it's more like a nickname it is a name which is used for a referencing to that particular act whereas when we say a long title then that long title gives the purpose of the enactment it tells us what is the objective of that act now this short title is generally not used for interpretation okay it is just for reference versus when you talk about the long title it is used for the purpose of interpretation however it is only giving a guidance towards interpretation if suppose there is a conflict between the section and this long title then we will give more importance to the section this basically this huge long title it gives us an object or intention about the statute it also tells you what is the significance of that particular law so for the companies act we know the long title is the act to consolidate and amend the laws relating to the companies so you can clearly understand what is the intention of the companies act it is basically to consolidate or create or to amend the laws which are relating to all the different companies in our country next internal aid is the preamble okay so what is a preamble a uh, preamble is the first part of the statute uh, before every statute there is a preamble which is given it is more like an introduction about the whole statute it gives you an object of the entire statute okay so it basically tells you what is this whole law about so for the companies act also there is uh, the preamble the preamble says that it is an act that consolidates and amends the laws relating to the company okay so here preamble tells you that the companies act is about the laws that are relating to regulation of the different companies in our country so is the preamble useful for interpretation of course yes it gives you the objective of the law okay but if suppose the preamble and a particular section they are in conflict okay section is saying something else versus preamble is saying something else in that case we are going to give more weightage to the section for preamble preamble is only for understanding the objective of a particular law it is basically aiding it is helping in interpretation but it does not have that much power next up we have the headings and the titles of the chapters and the sections now in the companies act we have discussed so many different chapters okay now when we say chapter chapter is basically a cluster of sections that are talking about the same topic okay so for example we have chapter 2 of the companies act which talks about incorporation of the company and the matters incidental thereto. now in that section number 3 onwards till section number 22 are stated all of these sections are about the incorporation of the company only they're talking about memorandum of association article of association how the company is incorporated about promoters etc right so all of those details are clustered into one chapter okay now this chapter has the heading incorporation of the company and the matters incidental thereto. now this heading of the chapter is it useful for interpretation the answer is yes of course yes for all of these sections which are covered in this chapter their purpose is coming from the heading so heading is basically giving a guiding light to what are these sections about okay it gives us the object internally every single section also has a heading okay and then sometimes some rare occasions certain subsections also have headings okay so now these sections for example here we have section number 20 in the companies act which talks about service of notice okay we have section number four which talks about article of association section five which talks about memorandum of association right so these different sections which are internal to a chapter they also have headings again whatever provision is stated inside that section its objective is written in the section's heading okay so yes definitely they can be used for interpretation but if suppose there is a conflict between the actual content of a section and the heading of a section or the heading of a chapter then we will give more to it, more weightage to the section Next up is our marginal notes. What are these marginal notes? So sometimes in a law, towards the left side or towards the bottom, uh, sometimes some additional notes are stated by the lawmakers. Okay, so this is not the actual section, but some sort of additional side note is given. Just like how when you also make notes or when you're reading a book, sometimes let's say you understand a paragraph in a book and you have some insight about that paragraph you have some additional ideas you have some additional examples then you write those additional examples towards the left side or the right side or the bottom of the page 
just like that we have the marginal notes also so in this tetude also after a section before a section seg like on the left or the right or the bottom sometimes there are some notes which are written by the lawmakers these are called marginal notes they are in the margin right and these notes they basically elaborate what is stated in that section they basically help you to understand that section and the applicability of that section so definitely they are very very useful for interpretation purpose but if suppose there is a conflict between the marginal notes and what is actually stated in the section then we will give more preference to the section not the marginal notes next we have the definition sections okay now in every single act we have section number 2 or section number 3 which contains a lot of definitions now when we say definitions they are basically certain terms which are repeatedly used throughout the act and their meaning has been properly defined in one single section only okay so that is your definition section it is generally section number 2 or section number 3 so when we are trying to interpret the statute we can use the definition section we can understand the meaning of those specific words from the definition section okay now in the companies act also we know there are so many different words that are properly defined in section number 2 So in company we know there is a private company, there is public company. We know the word company is there. We know the word director is there. We know the word officer is there, right? So all of these words, different words, are properly defined in your section number two. Okay. So with respect to the Companies Act, when we are trying to understand the meaning of the word company or private company or auditor, you know, so we have to only see the definition which is given in the Companies Act in section two. We are not going to make up our own meaning. We are not going to make up our own definition. okay now whenever we talk about these definition section these definitions are only applicable for that statute and throughout that act we will understand the meaning through that definition only so what is the use of this definition section it basically shortens the language of the act how see throughout the companies act we have this word company which is written over and over and over again okay the word auditor is written so many times so every time you cannot define it if you define this word every single time throughout the act then the act will become very very long versus if you put all those definitions in one place just one time then the act will automatically be smaller right so it shortens the language of the act plus it also helps us in interpretation now when we talk about the different types of definitions which are covered then these definitions can be restrictive in nature or they can also be extensive in nature what does that mean when we say restrictive it means that nothing more can be added to these definitions usually the words mean is stated in such definitions or means and includes is stated what does that mean uh, let's say i'm saying that the meaning of x y z means x comma y and z okay so the meaning of so and so means x y and z in that case here the word mean i'm using okay so in this case the definition will only include x y and z it is not going to include any other items so this is a restrictive definitions or we also say it is an exhaustive definition nothing else can be actually added into it okay another type of definition is an extensive definition or an inclusive definition okay here the words that are used are generally words like is deemed to include all of these words are actually used here okay so it includes words like include or to apply and include is deemed to include all of these words okay so in the same definition if let's say i change the words instead of mean i write includes then that basically means that this definition becomes an inclusive definition x y z definition includes x y and z it means that other items can also be added here the word includes is used so that means this definition is inclusive in nature it can include certain more items also these are simply examples of the items that can be included got it now sometimes the definition may also be ambiguous in nature when we say ambiguous it means confusing in nature okay so we may not be able to understand what does it exactly mean So in that case, we have to see that entire act. We have to see that entire provision. We have to try to understand the intention of the lawmakers. Accordingly, we have to interpret such a difficult or confusing definition. Sometimes the definitions may be subject to contrary context. That means they might not be suitable to the context in which they are stated. They might be different from the act's intention. In that case, again, we have to interpret it according to the intention of the lawmakers. next is illustrations what are illustrations sometimes under the section certain examples are given these are part of the statute so the lawmakers themselves they put down some sort of illustrations under the section in the indian contract act you can see many such sections wherein illustrations are also mentioned under that section 
okay so these illustrations basically elaborate the usage of that section can they be used for interpretation definitely yes okay so a section might say something accordingly you can use this example to understand that section but it may also be possible that there are more different types of examples in real life on which this section is going to apply so just because there is one example it does not mean that that section is restricted to that one example no okay so the example is not going to restrict the meaning of that statute there can be many more different types of examples also the example is definitely going to be used to understand the section but it is not going to limit the meaning of the section next is proviso so what is a proviso under the section or sometimes inside the section also sometimes it is stated provided that okay or further provided that that is called a proviso whatever is stated after that provided that that is called the proviso so generally in a proviso there is some additional information or an exception or certain additional conditions which are given it may be possible that the section is explained or it may be possible that an exception is given so there is a whole section a and then after that it is stated that provided that the section is not going to apply on section 8 companies okay so that means this entire section will not apply to section 8 companies okay it may be possible that it is written that section a is there and then after that it is written provided that in order to comply with this section you have to do follow certain conditions may be possible certain additional conditions are also specified okay so that is what proviso means now proviso is it useful for interpretation of course yes it is part of the statute so it is going to give us some conditions on those specific conditions or on those specific exceptions how the statute is going to apply we are going to understand that by reading the proviso next is explanation so from the meaning only explanation we understand that the explanation of that section is given in the explanation so sometimes what happens is that there may be a whole section and in that section a new kind of word is used and that word is not properly defined in the statute it is not defined in section 2 or section 3 in that case it may be possible that under that section there is an explanation which is added by the lawmakers and in that explanation it may be stated that this word which is used in this section it is going to be interpreted to mean like this and then the meaning may be specified okay so explanation sometimes give you some additional information about that section it may give you how that section is going to apply okay so that explanation is definitely very very useful for interpreting that section right the next internal aid is the schedules so what are the schedules see in the companies act we have schedule number 1 to schedule number 7 now these schedules contain a lot of very important details relating to the act so these schedules always have to be read along with the act so when you are reading the companies act you will also have to remember that there are some schedules wherever the schedules are applicable you also have to use these schedules and you have to read them appropriately so schedules generally contain law they are part of the statute they are equally important as the act and they have to be read accordingly and with the act for example the memorandum of association and article of association in the companies act it is covered by schedule 1 and the csr things are written in written in schedule number 7 csr activities The next point we have to remember is that we have to read the statute as a whole. So in the act, there are so many different sections, different chapters, different subsections are there. Whenever we are reading a statute, there are along with it certain rules also, certain notifications, certain clarifications, certain orders, certain schedules are there. We have to read all of this combined it together. It doesn't mean that you have to read one line of each of uh, these rules and statutes together. No, but when you are reading a particular section, if in that section a reference is made to the rule, then simultaneously also check the rule. If there is a reference made to a schedule, then simultaneously you also have to check the schedule. If there is a reference made to any other section of another act or the same act, then simultaneously, in order to understand that section, you also have to read that other section. Okay, so that is how you have to try to read the statute as a whole. if you properly want to interpret the statute next we move on to external aids of interpretation so external aids of interpretation are what they are basically again tools they are information that helps us in understanding the law but these are external to the statute so if i want to understand the companies act then external aids of interpretation will be outside the companies act outside the rules outside the schedules relating to the companies act okay so it includes a lot of things it includes the historical setting the previous laws the usage the way it is used in normal trade okay and then apart from that any uh, earlier acts are there any analogous acts are there any dictionary meanings are there any foreign decisions or indian decision decisions are there all of those are going to be helpful for us to understand the statute one by one let's see all of these first of all let's talk about the historical setting 
historical setting means the parliamentary background the discussions that happened when the act was coming into the picture the reason why that act came into the picture we have to see all of this we have to see the bill that was passed what were the changes that were made in the bill after which the act came into the picture all of that is the historical setting so basically that means the history of the law historical setting is very very important to understand the intention of the law why that law came into the picture what problem did it solve what were the changes what was the law before that okay so if suppose there is a specific provision or rule which you're not able to understand then you have to go back in time and then you have to see why that rule was brought what was the previous rule and then accordingly we can understand um, the meaning of that rule so that is your historical setting it is useful in interpretation next is consolidating statutes now what is consolidating statutes see sometimes it happens that there is an act and in an act there are many different amendments okay later on there are so many amendments that a new act is created to consolidate all of those amendments and that is called a consolidating statute in that case that previous act whatever the way it was interpreted that same interpretation is going to apply to this new consolidated institute also for example we had the companies act of 1956 which then became the companies act of 2013 so it was a consolidating institute there were many different changes they were all incorporated many new different changes were also brought forward okay so in that case if there is a specific provision which was common then previous interpretation is going to apply okay next up is analogous acts sometimes it happens that there is a statute and that entire statute is completely repealed or major parts of that act is repealed and a new act is brought okay so that is called analogous act in that case we have to try to understand what that later act says okay if there is conflict between that repealed act and new act then we have to understand we have to interpret according to the later act if suppose uh, there are certain things which are not mentioned in the later act we can use the interpretation from the previous act also the next interpretation aid is usage usage means the usage in trade practices so if suppose there is a statute which we are not able to understand we can see how it is interpreted in the normal day-to-day -day activities for example in negotiable instrument act we have a crossed check now how that operates in real life it is going to give, give us a glimpse of the way the statute is written versus how it is interpreted if you have any conflicts if you're not able to understand the statute then we can see how the actual people cross the checks how they negotiate that check and accordingly we can do the interpretation next point is the definition which is the dictionary definition so if suppose there is a specific po a point a word which is stated in the statute and that word has not been properly defined in that statute then how are we going to understand it so for that we can use certain dictionary definitions also so here we can use the technical dictionary also and we can also use the general dictionary if that word is specifically used in a technical sense then we have to use the technical dictionary if however that word is used in general sense then we can use the general dictionary also we will use that dictionary definition to interpret that particular word accordingly we are going to interpret the entire statute next is the use of the foreign decisions so see in india on certain matters of course there might be disputes and there might be certain case studies so first we have to give preference to indian case studies on certain statutes if suppose on a particular statute indian case study is not available then we can refer to any foreign decisions also but with respect to foreign decision also we have to refer to those countries which have similar laws like our countries okay the language of the statute and the objective of the statute and the uh, nature of the statute should be similar between our country and that other country then only we can use those foreign judgments okay so generally speaking our entire system is created based on the statute of england so we can definitely first of all give more preference to the judicial decisions which are taken place in england okay and then after that if suppose we do not have any such decisions for england also then we can go ahead and check for other countries as well now please note that here foreign decisions are used as a last remedy so if suppose the statute is absolutely vague we are not able to understand there is no indian decision also we have used every other source of understanding also and still we are not able to find out what is the solution then we can refer to foreign decisions okay so they don't have to be used as a primary aid they have to be used as the last resort next let's try to understand the rules of interpretation with respect to documents and deeds so what is documents and deeds it's something we have discussed already okay now with respect to documents and deeds also it may be possible that both the parties that are involved in this document or a deed they may 
have different opinion as to how to interpret different parts of these deeds. In that case, how are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to solve this discussion? How are we going to interpret these deeds and the documents? So in that case, again, all the rules that we have discussed above, they are going to be applicable. Okay, along with that, there are certain other points we have which we have to consider. We have to read the whole deed as a whole. Okay, so we have to try to understand all the different parts to the deed or the document. We have to try to harmonize each of these provisions. We have to reach read different provisions and we have to try to construct them in such a way that every single provision is given effect. We cannot give more priority to one over the other. But still, it may be possible that there is a conflict between two provisions which are stated in any document. In that case, what is going to happen? If suppose there is conflict and we cannot resolve the conflict between two different parts of the deed, then the first uh, provision, the first stated fact that is going to be prevalent. That means in a deed, if let's say there is point number one and then there is point number two, okay? Point number one and point number two are talking about two different things and there is no way to solve this dispute in that case point one is going to prevail we are going to do the interpretation based on point number one okay now it may be possible that there is a deed which is active now in that deed it is very important to understand what is the intention of the parties when they created that document okay the intention of the party is extremely important to understand what is stated in that instrument so when did they create this instrument what were the circumstances what was the purpose of that instrument all of that has to be considered accordingly we have to do the interpretation of that document next point is that if there is a particular word in the deed or the document it has to be interpreted the same way throughout that deed or the document we cannot have different meaning in different parts of the document for the same word the same word has to be interpreted in the same way right so with this we have completed the discussion of interpretation of statute we have discussed all the different rules relating to interpretation we have also discussed the different internal and external aids to interpretation i hope you have understood this entire lecture if you have any doubts please write them down in the comments or you can put them on the forum as well you would love to answer back to those right i hope this revision helps you